one thing that we are doing constantly is looking at the hijab issue in isolation it's a kind of one upmanship where hindus can feel empowered simply by imagining muslims as not only the other but as the inferior other in september 2021 Students at a government pre-university college in Udupi, Karnataka, were instructed not to wear the hijabs to college. In December, students wearing the hijab were barred from entering college premises and Muslim students rose in protest. The issue worsened when students mobilized to wear saffron scarves in protest against Muslim girls wearing the hijab. And on 5th February, the state government invoked the Karnataka Education Act 1983 to ban clothes that disturb equality, integrity and public order in schools and colleges. The case is currently being heard in the Karnataka High Court. The question here is, why do we suddenly find ourselves pitting a child's right to education against her religious beliefs? Does this run deeper than the hijab? We spoke with lawyer Varisha Farasid and political theorist Rajiv Bhargava to understand more. My first, very first reaction was that this should not happen in India. But I was a little surprised, shocked, but maybe not so much uh, because of what has been happening in India over the last few years. Frankly, I was shocked uh, that something like that had happened because. Uh, This has never been an issue in India. How did we get here? Secular has become a dirty word. It's become something to be mocked at, to be ridiculed, and even the secularists know if they use the language of secularism, it would be counterproductive. One thing that uh, we are doing constantly is uh, looking at the hijab issue in isolation what we have to do is we have to step back and look at what has transpired in the last 7 years so this seems to be completely manufactured and very much a part of the larger trend of putting muslims in their place inferiorizing them demonizing them it's a kind of one upmanship where hindus can feel empowered simply by imagining muslims as not only the other but as the inferior other it started first with the lynchings right the first aklak lynching case of dadri and after that we've seen the hate speeches more recently they were basically a call for genocide of the indian muslim if you have this kind of an argument that we are people who have no religious identity and therefore you should also get rid of your religious identity then what you get as a result of all this is domination by the majority of the minority so what are the rules of the game here if the general ethos is one of pluralism and if there are certain pluralist elements in various religions then those pluralist elements the government can either leave alone or it can even encourage them so the constitution continue to have this is dual attitude to religion because religion in india itself was viewed uh, in amb- as ambivalent therefore it adopted this policy of what i call principal distance that it will not separate itself from religion because it simply can't it will keep some distance from all religions but it will engage with religions or disengage from them depending upon which of these will reduce uh, institutionalized religious domination right why is this bigger than just hijabs and uniforms this hijab controversy the way it's being fanned is for two reasons one is to show that the indian muslim is very regressive and uh, they oppress their women and the second is to distract from all the criticism that the indian government was receiving internationally and nationally for what is happening to the indian muslim today the bjp wants to be the savior of muslim indian women and i i think that's a completely false narrative that they have created when the triple talaq matter came up 
it was the supreme court that set aside uh, the triple talaq so it had nothing to do with the bjp we saw the sully uh, deals recently now what is that the bjp being the savior of the indian muslim women no they are being targeted on a daily uh, basis by the bjp trolls please see what also happened in the anti ca protests it was the muslim women who came out and who took charge and who said that this is a discriminatory bill this goes against our constitution but what is it uh, that uh, the bjp and the right wing parties kept saying they kept saying no no they are being tutored by their men they are not really bothered about whether the muslim uh, girl gets educated or not they are only bothered about politicizing it and about showing that muslims uh, are more regressive and more patriarchal than any other community in india this is not some one little flank of some uh, you know mad crazy group this is being enabled right from the top they never condemn it but why will they condemn it they have enabled it they have enabled the unleashing of this sort of hatred against the indian muslim what can our courts and governments do to resolve this wise politicians and sound judges and alert civil society alert citizens a good and open and vibrant public uh, space and an active media all these multiple agents are responsible for sustaining this idea of principal distance today what is happening is that we are negating both community rights and individual rights we are uh, not only denying communities uh, the rightful place in our society we are also destroying political freedom in india traditionally the high courts uh, have done a much better job in upholding the fundamental rights of the citizens and i think even when you see the last few years there have been many disappointments from the supreme court the courts cannot uh, do everything because a lot of these things have to happen via the legislative route but the courts can definitely look at issues of life and liberty and specially look at rights of minorities when they are being targeted with more urgency and by the courts i definitely mean the supreme court it has become a question of what reasonable restrictions can be placed in the interest of public order What's the harm in keeping religion out of our schools and colleges? What we what is happening today is the complete domination of state symbols by one religion. And this is really uh, in not just bad taste, it is uh, a way of uh, alienating one's fellow citizens. We need to include everybody. We don't have to exclude anyone. Today's issue is not about seclusion and uh, about segregation of men and women and so on i think it's an assertion of a certain political identity which is threatened very badly uh, and that that sort of relates to the larger point that we were making if you have persistent demonization and inferiorization of a certain community then people from within the community will find ways of asserting themselves because they don't want to be pushed against the wall uh, they will find ways and this is one of the ways in which they're doing it it's not just in india it's ev- it's in large parts of the world where there is a lot of islamophobia that this is happening so where do we go from here how does a community prosper whether it's the muslim community or any other minority community there are two important aspects to it one is equality of opportunity for members of these community and second is to do away with discrimination both of which is provided uh, for in our constitution that unless there is a narrative which is created which is an enabling narrative not a narrative of hatred you are not going to get to the other rights because even the privileged amongst the muslims today are feeling under siege so i cannot even begin to imagine what the local redi wala is feeling you can do what you want at home you can also do what you want in your club or in your private company even in a private college but when it comes to the state which belongs to everybody the state should make its its identity markers 
those identity markers should be in principle available to all uh, and with which everybody can identify so i would i would suggest that we just recover our pluralism which is our basic strength i mean this is what we've been known for uh, for many millennia you know we can find uh, we can negotiate something as we have done in the case of sikhs right they are allowed to wear uh, a turban which is the same color as the uniform now uh, what is a hijab it's not a burqa it's not a niqab you you are covering your head with a dupatta so instead of wearing the dupatta on your chest you are also draping it around your head and as long as that dupatta is the same color as the color of the uniform i don't see what the whole issue is about i mean so i think we can easily resolve this problem if we have the intention of doing so if on the other hand the whole point is to create trouble then even the most uh, yeah in all of these things will become threatening and uh, a violative of uh, you know something common what has happened now is that when you see the women they are asserting their identity they are saying that we want to wear the hijab so it does not seem that they are coerced They're all uh, a product of our socialization and of our initial socialization so what you know so choice also is never perfect right sometimes it is uh, something that we've grown up with or we but but that is for any choice any choice you and i make so it it cannot be a very selective argument that for hijab it's a bad socialization for something else it's good socialization we are all a product of our socialization but these women seem to be doing out of their own free will i'm not supporting the hijab or not supporting it i'm saying it seems like they want to wear it and it is not disturbing anyone else this hijab thing is a distraction it will come and go the court will either allow the girls or not allow the girls but i'm saying that we will still be left with the fundamental question of the hatred that has been unleashed